Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Winston Sankey and I'm the technical manager for eCurr. Um, I, I get a little excited about this product whenever I present it or train, you know, offer training sessions on it. Um, a little background about myself. I'm a mechanical engineer uh, by training. Um, I've been a mechanical engineer, engineer for over 20 years. Um, I started out uh, designing rooftop units for carrier. And then I did um, the smaller window shakers for Frigidaire for a number of years. And then after that, I worked for a Chinese uh, manufacturer for about 15 years. Um, I spent uh, quite a bit of time going back and forth between the US and China, um, helping them develop products for, for market in the US. Um, that led to uh, a long stint supporting ductless products, right? Um, ductless uh, inverter mini splits. Um, that was my introduction to the inverter technology, right? And, and I thought this was the, the best thing since sliced bread, right? But then this product came along. And the reason why I like, really, really like this product, why I get excited about this product is because it's what we're used to, right, in, in, in the U.S. Um, I grew up in, in Jamaica, and Jamaica is more of a duckless market. Um, in this, in, in the U.S., we, we have ducted systems, right? So a lot of you guys are used to installing that product versus the ductless product. Um, but the ductless product, the efficiency that it, that it delivers drives the market that way, right? And that market is growing. But when you have a product that has the same efficiency, or in some cases, higher efficiency than ductless products, and your homeowner gets to use their 24 volt thermostat, you can't beat that, right? Um, there are a lot of these products in the market, inverter products now, but we're going to show you some things that are quite unique about our product, and it's going to make your, your lives a lot, a lot um, easier. As Rick mentioned earlier, we, you know, we consider ourselves a tech company that happens to sell unitary equipment. But what he didn't quite get into is the, the ideas behind this product is that we wanted to make your, your guys' lives easier. Um, if you want to, we talk about the IoT gateway. The IoT gateway isn't for the homeowner. It's for you guys. The, the ease of installation is not about the homeowner. It's about you guys. Because there's one thing um, that we can't, we can't buy, we can't fake, is the fact that our brand is not as well known as some of the other brands out there, right? But if you guys have good experience with our product, if you guys understand the support, the technology, the ease of installation, of our product, then you are advocates, you are ambassadors for us, all right? So I'm gonna get into um, a lot about the product. You guys hopefully are gonna get as excited as I am about it. Uh, we're gonna talk about the products, some of the technology, uh, the components. We're gonna talk about the heat pump installation, all right? It's a heat pump product, but it's unique in that it's, it, it's, it leaves the factory as a heat pump, but you can install it as a straight cooling unit, right? You have homeowners out there who They'd rather have their furnace, run their furnace, or they may have geothermal, right? They'd rather have those, uh, that kind of technology apply uh, heating to their, to their homes. So you can actually customize the product. This is probably one of the most customizable products you're ever going to uh, install. The way it leaves the factory doesn't necessarily mean that's the way you're going to install it, right? So you may have the same two pieces of equipment, outdoor and indoor, and you have one installed at location A, operating quite different than you have it set up at location B. The same pieces of equipment. And we're going to show you how we're going to do that. I have uh, in here uh, in oh, installation, um, heat pump installation. I'm del I deliberately have these slides here, but we're going to go quickly over those slides. We're not going to spend a lot of time on those slides. And the reason we're not going to spend a lot of time on those slides is because the installation process is no different than you've been doing your entire careers, right? It is not your typical inverter type system where you have to go relearn uh, something new. This is what you're used to. Um, the IoT uh, device and app installation, we're gonna talk about that because that's gonna become fundamental to how you interact with the product. But there are certain features of this app that I think you guys are gonna get excited about. I'm sure you guys have been on job sites where an error code comes up on a product and you're wondering, hey, what does this error code mean? How do I troubleshoot this? The solutions to all those error codes are built in the app. 
So you, you have a, a service manual on your person every time you leave your house for the eCareer product. Um, you know, in addition to that, you have the tech support number that you can call in directly. Um, so it, it's, it's, again, the entire idea around the product is built around you, you guys. Ease of installation, uh, because we understand that your time is best spent selling new products, installing new products, not going back and working on products that you've installed two months ago, three months ago, right? Uh, we're gonna look at some of the, the customizable features on this product, the field settings that you can customize, and we're gonna you know, glance over the parts list. You're gonna see there are very few parts um, that, are, that are required to service this product. And as I go through the presentation, I, I welcome questions, right? Um, one of the reasons why we encourage that is because when we first came to market with this product, we had different ideas about what the market really wanted. The, the, for the, from, from the overall perspective, we had the big points, but there were certain key things that only you guys can tell us. And as we got feedback from you, we went back and we were able to upgrade the product, make, make some changes, and I'm also get, gonna get into how easy it is for us to make changes and implement some of your guys' ideas you know, uh, into the product. So, as Rick mentioned, or SKUs, we have very limited SKUs. I don't have the gas furnace here. I don't have the furnace on this slide, on this presentation, but a very condensed number of SKUs. We've got only two outdoor units. When I say two, I mean two chassis sizes, right? But within each cabinet, you have this unit. It's labeled a EOAD 18H2436. This just designates that it's an equator outdoor unit 18 sear, it's configured as a heat pump, and it's a two or three ton unit. This unit will run anywhere from 18 ton and a half all the way up to three and a half ton, right? By the flip of a dip switch, you can have it run from, a, uh, you can have it configured as a 24,000 BTU unit or a 36,000 BTU unit, two or three ton. But because of the inverter technology and the variability of that compressor, you will run down to, to part load conditions at 18,000 or even below 18,000 BTU. We've seen units, these units run at 12,000, so a ton of capacity, depending on your load condition, right? And if your load is above three ton, we've, we've actually had this unit run at three and a half ton. There's a bit of an overlap here when you get to the three, three and a half ton range, because your four, five ton unit can also, because of the variability of the compressor and the fan motor, you can actually have this unit run down to three and a half ton, all the way up to I've actually seen six tons of capacity on this unit. Um, I have one at my house, and last summer, I, just, I was sitting in the office and I decided to just check it on the app, and it was putting out 72,000 BTU of cooling. And I'm in Miami, where it gets pretty hot and humid in the summer, right? Um, we have um, different size uh, air indoor units, two, three, four, and five ton. We also have case coils and furnaces as well. Right, so you, ha you can get a full e-career system matchup, or you can match our unit with any third-party air handler. That's the beauty about this product. Just about everybody else's inverter type system, you have to have a matching system, right? Not only do you have to have a matching system, but in many cases, you have to have a proprietary thermostat, right? And as, as, as Kelly and, and John had mentioned earlier, with those thermostats, a homeowner has to learn something new especially these inverter type thermostats, the, these communicating thermostats, they have these special settings and features and the, the user interface is quite different than the homeowner is used to, so they have to relearn something. With our product, you can connect our product with just about any 24 volt thermostat out there. So it's pretty much an on-off switch and we take care of all of the other technology, ramping up and ramping down of the, 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 the components internally using temp sensors, right? So what are some of the, the, the conditions that you have to have if you're using a third party air handler or, or indoor unit? Can't be a micro channel, right? And you can't have a micro channel indoor unit because if you're running in, in cooling only, that's fine because you're, that's a low pressure side, right? You are after your metering device, so the pressures are low. But if you intend to have the unit operate as a heat pump with a micro channel, you create another a restriction upstream Right? Because with, with a heat pump, what happens is your high pressure doesn't go to your condens condenser anymore. Right? It's not in the condenser, it's now gonna be going to the, the, the indoor unit. Right? And if that indoor unit has very small uh, refrigerant uh, piping, 
then you're going to create high head pressure, and you're just going to short cycle. And if it short cycles a, n a number of times, then it's going to lock itself out. And we'll get into some of those um, safety features on the unit as we go through. A non-communicating system. So if you have a proprietary indoor unit that requires a specific outdoor unit that matches up with a proprietary communicating uh, thermostat, you can't use, our, our, you can't use our, our, our heat pump. You can't use fixed pistons, right? Because you, you have the variability of the compressor. With inverter systems, the compressor is always varying. The speed, the output of that compressor always changes. And so you need a metering device that can match that. And a fixed piston doesn't do that. So you can't have fixed piston, same thing for capillary tube. And you need a heat pump TXV if you're going to run in heat pump, right? Because you need that refrigerant to be able to bypass the metering when the unit is running in the opposite direction, right? When it's running heat pump versus straight cooling. And it's, it's advisable to have an adjustable TXV, all right? Our unit will, the auto charge feature, when we auto charge the system, we're looking at subcooling. So it auto charged to a specific subcooling, depending on your line set, your indoor unit, uh, condition and the outdoor ambient temperature, right? So your subcooling is going to be fixed by the, by the, by the system. It's going to be look for that, that subcooling, but your superheat could, could, be, could be off. So you, 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 you set your subcooling, and then you're going to have to go in and adjust the, 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 the superheat by the adjustable TXV, right? This, we've actually had occasions where, where, where contractors have called in um, to our tech support center um, because they have installed a product, they, they changed the, 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 the TXV to an adjustable TXV, they charged the unit, and they're getting high humidity inside. The unit's running, it's cooling down real quickly, but it's not pulling out the moisture. That's because they actually hadn't set the unit up you know, correctly. So the, the, the charge is not, is not quite correct because their superheat was off. We've actually, in our system, sitting in, in, in our tech support center, had our guys walk a contractor through how to actually adjust his TXV to get a right charge and get a unit set up for his condition. So again, you can match the Equator system completely, or you can use a third party. No microchannel on the indoor unit, and in, in terms of thermostats, you can use just about any thermostat. I have an X here on the Nest E. That's the, the entry-level Nest thermostat. For some reason, our unit doesn't really talk to that thermostat very well, right? Uh, but just about any other thermostat, um, the unit works quite well with. Rick mentioned 20 SEER, right? The, 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 the 20 SEER Ultra Series. I'm going to go back real quickly and just show you. We only have, again, two outdoor unit chassis, right? But we can cover the range one and a half all the way up to five ton with two outdoor unit chassis. Most of our unit matchups are um, like size, two ton, two ton, three ton, three ton, four ton, four ton, right? Outdoor and indoor unit um, matchups. But if you match our five ton outdoor unit with the three ton air handler, as long as you have your indoor load is three tons, you're gonna get 100% heating capacity all the way down to five degrees Fahrenheit and 100% cooling capacity all the way up to 113 degrees Fahrenheit outdoor unit, outdoor ambient temperature. Right? And you're going to get 20 sear, right? So you're oversizing your outdoor unit to your indoor unit. The same thing if you set your, this unit to a three ton and match it, match it up to a two ton air handler. You're going to get 100% heating capacity, 100% cooling capacity. Question for you. When you do that, mm -hmm. are you flipping the dip switch to make it a four ton unit or are you leaving it as a factory default? You, you, you're leaving it as a five ton. And um, uh, uh, that's a good point. I like to, with these inverter type products, because you have that wide um, operating bandwidth, if you have a, a load, say you're, you have a, I don't know, four ton load, and you're putting a four or five ton unit, I would leave the outdoor unit in a five ton. The reason why I'd leave the outdoor unit as a five ton is that your efficiency, your sear, increases when you have a, a, a larger surface area on your condenser, right? because that's where your compressor, your head pressure will be lower. And if your head pressure is lower, then your compressor is gonna pull less amps, and the less amps, less watts, your efficiency is gonna go up. 
So always leave the unit in the, in the higher capacity outdoor and match your indoor load. Mm -hmm. When you, you talk about efficiency, mm -hmm. this unit is uh, like compared like between 4,000 and 5,000. Yeah. 5,000. I know that how is efficiency, how the unit is rejecting the heat, mm -hmm. the coil. Mm -hmm. This is a small coil. Like if you compare it to the train, 5,000 train, high or <laughs> yeah. balance is high. Yes. It has more coil. Yes. That means I can know exactly it rejects heat efficiently. Yes. But this is a small How are you going to do reject efficiency yeah. like that as a train or Lennox? Most, Most of those train or Lennox that you see with those huge coils, yeah. they are fixed speed compressors. So that compressor is running at 100% all the time. It doesn't matter what your load conditions are. But they have if, inverter. They are modulated. Even if they have some, some of them that modulate with inverter, they don't, they, the way their algorithm works, okay, let's, 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 let me back up and tell you this as well. Not all inverters are the same. And I'm going to get into that a little bit further in the line. You've got inverters and everybody, once it has more than one stage, once it modulates any, if it goes one, two, three stages, they call it an inverter. And technically, they're correct. It's an inverter, right? It, it variable, it's a variable speed product. But we've got 40 stages of variability. And if I had a whiteboard, I could show you. Let me, let me see if I can draw this for you. When, when you have load condition, right? So let's say you have a compressor, uh, a system that is, um, it has four stages, right? So this is stage one. The compressor is going to start, it's going to run here. It can run at this stage. It can run at this stage, or it can run at this stage, right? These are the stages that it can run. If your load condition is here, right? That compressor is going to run up here. So at that point, you're pulling more, you're using more energy than needed to meet your load condition down here. But the unit can be marketed as a variable speed product because it does vary, right? They, they, they're not incorrect that it varies. But it's not varying in the most efficient way. With our unit, we've got 40 different stages. So a lot more stages. So if my load condition is here, my unit's going to be running here. It's not going to be running all the way up here. So I don't need a bigger, as huge outdoor coil as they do because my, my compressor is not pumping as hard. The reason why you need a big, the big coil is because your head pressure gets high. If the compressor is running at a much higher um, frequency, then your pressures, pressures are going to be higher, and you need to reject that heat somehow. The way you reject that heat is with a larger coil. But if your compressor isn't running as high as here, let's say I had more stages and I could run here, then my coil doesn't have to be as big to make the same, to reject the same heat, right? So, the, There's one you know, other the difference too, on the condenser fan motor, their condenser fan motor ramps up way more than a train that takes out a fan motor. So you've only got four stages as well in that fan motor for theirs. The variable speed and it ranks as well, exactly where it used to be at. Right, yeah, that's a good point Wes also made, in that our, <laughs> our fan motor also has nine different speeds that it runs at. I don't know what the train does. Maybe they have two, so they're pulling more watts. So their efficiency can't be as high because they're pulling more energy. They have to compensate for that energy usage by rejecting more heat faster. Actually, everybody good with that? You can, uh, if, if, if you guys have, have any, um, any doubts, or if you really want to get comfortable with our product, you can, you can download our service manual, right? Every, everything that I, I present here in terms of the technical stuff that you're going to see later on, that stuff is available on the website, right? You can compare our technical information to train. You can look at how many stages they call out or wh whichever other product you want to look at and, and, and compare it to ours. You know, it's, it's, it, you, you'll see. As, as I was mentioning, with, the, with our um, matchup, the, the, the two ton to the three ton, you get, you get 20 sear, right? Um, John uh, had mentioned that one of, the, one of the things that gave him confidence in bringing this product on is that we have, um, we have some history in, in markets that are much harsher than yours, especially on the heating side. 
we were very surprised. Our product really came to market. We started selling the product in 2017. We really started selling really hard in 2018. And we started selling really hard in 2018 in early January, um, fe February timeframe. And you know where the, the, sales, the, sale, the sales was coming from? The Northeast, Massachusetts. That was our number one market and probably still is our number one market. In the winter time, we're installing hundreds of products in the winter. And the folks who are installing the product as a primary heat source. So they're using a mini split, and this is a market that is a gas furnace, oil heat market, and they're using a, uh, a, an inverter type system, heat pump, as their primary heat. Um, we have one con contractor there uh, that does not even install a backup heat with our units. That's how confident they are in, in the fact that we can you know, provide the, the heating uh, needed for, for, for that market, and that's a pretty harsh market. Um, so, sorry, is there a particular reason why no microchannel? Yeah, because if you, if you run the unit as a cooling only, an AC only, microchannel is okay. But if you run it as a heat pump, then that, the, 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 the small uh, opening of the channel creates a uh, restriction when you're running in heat mode, and then the compressor is going to cycle off on high pressure um, and then lock itself out. So, you can do this cooling only. You yeah, can do straight cooling cool only. Fine, straight cool is fine, yeah, right. And yeah, and they don't. They, they, your, your airflow also gets restricted some with, with, with microchannel. That's why there's no microchannel heat pumps that I'm aware of. Yeah, the, the, yeah, the primary reason is the, the head pressure um, for, for microchannels. So we've, I've, I've spoken about the physical equipment, right? We also have the technology portion of it, the IoT gateway that Rick mentioned earlier. This for us is a huge differentiator because you can be sitting in your, on vacation and know that your, your customer's uh, unit has a faulty sensor or that it may have a defective TXV um, that you might be flooding back through your, through your TXV. You'll get an alert while you're on vacation. You can call one of your teammates and say, hey, I need to go check this house and, and adjust the, the system over there. You don't have to fly back. You don't, your customer doesn't have to be down. Um, the technology here is, is um, extremely, extremely helpful. Again, we designed this around you guys. The homeowners, we don't give them access to this app. We don't give them access to, the, to, to look at the system. Otherwise, they become your worst nightmare. Right? Um, but for you, it, it's, it's peace of mind knowing that if the unit is overcharged or undercharged, you're going to get an alert. We, we understand that. And just to qualify, if you have a Nest or an Echobee or one of the other web performance thermostats, they still can do all their web work, you know, turning the unit on, turning it off, do all that stuff with that thermostat. They're just not getting access to the performance level changes through the, the IoT. So that's yours alone, but the customer still has Wi-Fi and yes. connectivity through the thermostat. Yes. So it's still a Wi-Fi connected system. <clears throat> yes, yes, for sure. Um, we, we, Rick mentioned our warranty and our labor warranty, right? The pro product warranty and labor warranty. One, one thing that gives us confidence in offering those kind of warranties for, for our, uh, um, our heat pump system, and especially generally systems like these, you have to go through um, dealer certified training, hours of dealer certified training to get that level of warranty from any of the other manufacturers. But we have the confidence to, 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 to offer that warranty straight out of the box because we're helping with the installation of the product. Not physically, we're not near on site with you. But if you were to go on a job site and install a product and you leave that product undercharged or it's overcharged, you're gonna get a, an alert. We're gonna see it. Um, and, and Trinity, the labor warranty that we have with the product also, we, we, with HVAC equipment, a lot of these, um, you get a lot of failures. Sometimes you get failures in the field, right? Three months, four months, six months down the road, you'll get a, a, a product failure. A lot of that failure has to do with the installation. It had nothing to do with the equipment or, or the quality of the equipment to begin with. And we understand that from the get-go. So we wanted to make sure that any piece of equipment that gets installed, it's installed properly. And if it isn't, we'll send you an alert 
saying, hey, your unit seems to be undercharged, you need to add uh, uh, you know, an ounce of refrigerant or two ounces of refrigerant, you're going to get an alert. If after a while that alert we, we see, because we can see every time that unit is accessed, we can see every time the disconnect is pulled, every time the unit goes offline, we have access to that. If we don't see that the, the system has been corrected in terms of the refrigerant charge, someone from our tech support center is probably going to reach out to you um, with a phone call saying, hey, you know, this particular product you installed at X address seems to be undercharged. You know, you should go back and add some refrigerant. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a service to you and it's a service to your customer um, that, that we, we provide. Um, but we understand that if the unit is properly charged at install, then it's going to run for years without any issues. Um, sometimes a unit may be overcharged, right? And in, in, in an overcharged situation, unit use, use more, especially if they install it late in the season, and then the unit starts running in heat pump mode, you're not going to find a defect in the product until winter, until summer, excuse me. Because unit, the, the, the heat pumps use more refrigerant in the heating cycle than it does in the cooling cycle. So you might be perfect, running perfectly fine in heating, but once you go to cooling, when you need less refrigerant, you start flooding, right? And then the system is going to fail. So we want to make sure that you have the charge right and that, because six months down the road, if that happens, what are you going to say? The equipment is bad. It only lasted six months. But it really wasn't the, the, the equipment. It was you know, the pro fact that it wasn't charged. So what do you do in a scenario where you're not capable of connecting the equipment to the internet? It, this uses cell signal, right? Okay. So um, you don't necessarily have to have internet access. Okay. You just need to have uh, in an area where there's a cellular signal. Yeah. And right? I, I so how about if you're in a dead zone? Right? If you're in a dead zone, then you won't have access to, to monitoring, okay. right? But we do have what we call an IoT toolkit. So for diagnosing an issue, so let's say you have a unit that's installed in a dead zone. You, you, your monitoring won't work, but the system will work just fine as your everyday uh, inverter unit, right? You have an issue with the unit a year, two years down the road, customer calls and said the unit isn't working or something is up. You want to know what happened. You want some history on that product. We have what's called an IoT toolkit that will be at the distributor. You can take it to the, to the, to the job site. You can plug it into the unit. Once you take it back to the distributor, all they need to do is just plug it into any, so once, any outlet, and it's going to upload the, the, that information. Our guys in our tech center will be able to see the history of the product. How about as a technician, mm -hmm. if we walk up to a unit and we don't have that stuff, what's going to tell us what the issue is? There oh. LEDs? Oh, yeah, I'm going to get into that. Okay. There, yeah. So on the unit, there's, a, there's an LED. Um, and you can actually check every single thing on the product. So on that LED, you'll have the last three error codes. Right? So you'll have the current error code, the one before that, and the one before that. So you'll be able to have some history on what happened. You'll see you can get your pressures. You don't need to have your gauges hooked up to the unit to get high pressure, low pressure, superheat, subcool. It'll tell you the actual superheat, the actual subcooling. You don't have to calculate anything. Right? It's, it's very, very tech friendly. So our IoT gateway is this box. It connects to the unit. And it's one of the simplest thing you're, things you're ever going to do. Um, you don't have to worry about taking out a laptop and configuring the thing. All you do is plug it in to the, to the, to the, the board on the unit, throw your disconnect, and it's going to power up. It's going to initialize. It's going to look for the cell service, and it's going to start transmitting. Um, within six, seven minutes, we'll be able to see that information. And, and your unit's going to be online, registered. So how do we use the data? We actually use the data to, A, um, drive improvements to the product. Um, th th there's there's a, a key thing about the IoT gateway that isn't often mentioned, right? You guys have smartphones and smart watches. Every now and then, Apple will send an update to, the, to their watch or, or to their phone, right? Um, Samsung does the same thing. If they come up with an improvement on the product, they update the software on, the, on, the, on, on your equipment. We do the same thing through the IoT gateway. So we send updates to the product if we find 
um, any operating condition that will best improve the performance of the product, we will update the product through the IoT gateway as long as there is self-service. You won't know when it's happening. Your homeowner won't know when it's happening, but it happens. So a product that was installed in, in 2017 has the same software as one that's installed in 2021, right? If, this, if it were a different product, you'd have to go buy a new board because you know, this unit isn't performing so well and I need to upgrade it. The factory has to send you a new board. You have to go to the job site, install that new board. With our product, no trip charge. On that note, like he said, it's like if, you have, if you're in a dead zone, mm -hmm. how will that thing update? It will not. So how would, you, how would I be able to update that? With the same toolkit. The same. So the same toolkit you bring to the job site, you plug it in. Actually, we had, we, and we've had two or three cases like this. Okay. Um, when we first came to market, we had one case out in the eastern end of Long Island. Uh, we had a contractor there. Actually, he deliberately didn't put an IoT gateway on his product, right? And then he was having some performance issues, and we told him, hey, you need to, you know, we'd like to be able to see the product to, to help you diagnose what's going on. He said he doesn't have an IoT gateway. We sent him a toolkit. He brought over to the, to, the, to the product, plugged it into the unit, and it was updated, right? So we, we do have the workaround for, for those areas that have no cell service. Because we, we are, we're always in the middle of nowhere putting the system in, and mm -hmm. our phones don't work. So right. if our phones don't work, then ain't nothing going to work out. Yeah, 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 yeah. But let me, let me, let me say this as well. All right. the, the, the bandwidth, the baud rate on, these, on the IoT gateway is about 9,600, right? That is the, 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 the amount of data uh, transmission that was on cell phones back in 1997, right? It's like AOL dial-up. Yeah, yeah, it's like dial-up. So, so you're really not using as much. So we've had techs out in the field that are calling us and they can't really speak to us on the phone because the, it's so choppy, but we're seeing the unit just fine. Okay. So in those areas, it may not be true dead zone. Okay, so be then dead because of, our phone don't work, just say that thing won't work. Yeah, your phone is data heavy right now. Gotcha. This thing doesn't need as much, so it'll, it'll work. So when the um, updates are happening, mm -hmm. and you say, we're not going to notice it, the customer's not going to notice it, does the system change at all as far as, it's not going to tell them that it's changing, but will it not cool or not heat? Or no, no. In terms of heating, cooling, it's going to work fine. Usually, the, the change happens when unit cycles off, right? Remember, even though it's an inverter system, we're still using a 24 volt thermostat, which is a switch, right? So your system hits um, set condition, the, the compressor is gonna cycle off. Once it cycles off, th that's when, the, f the next time it cycles off, that's when the updates are gonna take effect, right? So your, your homeowner will not lose any, any uh, heating or cooling performance during the update. Kelly had mentioned our footprint. I think this is one of the, the, the biggest attractions, one of the bigger attractions to our unit as well. We have units installed in areas on the, the, the coast in, in Maryland, um, in apartment complexes, where you have to have the unit on a balcony or in a, in a tight space. Some of these guys, they can't get these bigger units through the door to get it out to the balcony, but our unit fits. Just about any doorway, our unit will fit right through. 36 inches, what's, it? what's a door, standard door size? 30 inches, 36 inches? Yeah, our unit will fit, fit right through. So in a lot of these tight spaces, you have um, new developments, especially senior living developments where you have these zero lot line space places. Our unit fits quite well in those places. And the sound level on the product um, is, is extremely, extremely low. It's, it's akin to a mini split, not quite as low as a mini split, but you wouldn't be um, faulted to think it's a mini split running outside based on the sound of the product. Um, a lot of these apartment buildings, apartment complexes, um, senior living um, developments, they have noise restrictions on outdoor units now, right? You can't have this unit too loud, you can't have this unit. Not one of those places would reject an equator unit because we meet the, 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 the sound, outdoor sound quality. Uh, standard for just about any place that has a, a um, you can probably get into it later, but there's also a feature in, on your phone that you can go in there for a night set so it lowers the fan speed. Right. And it does it for X amount of time. Right. Yeah, that's a great point that Wes, that Wes um, just, 
just more than on. And we'll get into it a little bit later. But it's part of the, um, the, the customizable nature of our product, where you can have one unit with a night, with a night mode set, set up and another unit with uh, a different level of night mode setup or a different defrost level setup, which, which we'll get into. I like this slide. You know why I like this slide? I like this slide because even though you guys might not be aware of this name, just about every other name on the list, you guys would be, should, should be familiar with. Um, the compressor we're using is, is a Mitsubishi electric compressor. Mitsubishi, um, as some of you, got, you guys might know, is the company that pioneered the duckless uh, product, at least in the US. They were the only ones running ads 10, 15 years ago um, for, for that uh, product. We're using their compressor. We're using a Panasonic uh, variable speed outdoor fan motor, DC fan motor that varies, I told you, nine different stages of fan speed that we get from this fan motor. And a Sajidemoya EEV. Um, these are all top shelf equipment components in here. Um, the EEV has 480 different stages, pulses. So in terms of your metering device, you get precise refrigerant metering. Or the PCB on our unit is a one-piece PCB, the, the board. If you look at a lot of these communicating inverter type units, you'll find three or four boards, and I'll show you a couple of slides with those. For, for a tech who isn't familiar or, or you know, comfortable with, with, with all these circuitry, you, you get stage fright when you open one of those units and you don't know where to start. You know, we've got one, one PCB, six screws, it's a quick swap out, right? Another thing that we, we have in our unit is that we have an EMI filter in our unit. Even some ductless units you won't find EMI filters in, right? And an EMI filter is an, an electromagnetic interference filter and what that does is, uh, with inverter type systems, even though our unit is quote unquote not a communicating system, the components inside the outdoor unit are all talking to each other, right? So um, with inverter type units, whether it's a ductless mini splits, a VRF unit, um, any type of these products, they communicate um, through temperature sensors and the PCB, right? So the temperature sensor is gonna sense the temperature, your suction, your discharge, whatever temperature, and then it's gonna say, it's gonna relay that information back to the PCB. The PCB is gonna say, hey, based on these temperatures, my compressor needs to operate at this frequency or that frequency. And it's gonna send that information to the compressor. The compressor is gonna to get to that frequency and it's gonna relay the information back to the, the board that says, hey, I'm running at a frequency you told me to run at. If that communication isn't happening efficiently and clearly, one's talking French, one's talking Chinese, then what's gonna happen is that the system is gonna throw an error code because they, they don't know what they're saying. That is why an EMI filter is good because it cleans up all the electromagnetic interference so that that communication can happen on a clear channel. How robust is built? That the EM is a filter and this one here. Yeah. Again, it's the storm when it hit. The storm has a charge. It's gonna discharge and- The discharge storm is gonna kill it. The storm's gonna kill it. Storm's gonna kill it. I'll yeah. just say that right now. How good? Just like a storm is gonna kill your ductless mini. How are you gonna protect it? With a, with a, with a surge protector. Okay. So every one of these units, and, and I say this, this is my, 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 my public service announcement to you guys. Um, not just for our product, but for any inverter type products, a ductless mini split, a VRF system, always put a surge protector at your outdoor unit disconnect. They have these point of view search protectors. It's not very expensive. What? Uh, you guys have them? You know, like less than 60 bucks. Yeah. Depending on how crazy you want to get. And one thing to point out, too, we got some of the uh, eCore products in, and they had an update to that filter, the EMF filter. They actually provided us the filters for free and then paid us to change them out on every one of the units. Their concern as a company, specifically a company that's four or five years old, is that their products work the best they can when they're out in the field. They're gonna provide the support to make sure that those units are working great. Because again, he mentioned it earlier, Winston did, you're gonna be their advertiser. You're gonna go out and say, buy this unit. These units work great, let me show you how it works. If it's not functioning, they're not gonna sell them. So they, at least my experience has been, they go above and beyond. 
and no. providing the filter was a, a nice touch for some products that we got in. Yeah. So that was nice. But yes, we recommend surge protectors on uh, just about anything that's electronic. Help if you got an Xbox at home, put put a freaking power filter on the Xbox and stay in place. And this is like putting an Xbox outside without any kind of protection, electrical protection. It's the same thing. Um, we, we, the unit is designed with protection for brownout conditions, right? Um, like I said, I grew up in Jamaica. Brownout is a common thing there, right? Our electricity grid is not like yours. It, it, it's very unstable. So brownouts happen. In my past life, you know, dealing with ductless mini splits, um, the company that I work for, they would put um, these, the, the, the protection for brownouts on products that they sold outside the US, right? And then they started selling ductless units in the US in 2005, 2006, somewhere there. And they didn't have that protection on the unit. And they were like, hey, Winston, you know, we don't need to put brownout protection on, on units come, going to the US because you guys have a very mature grid. You're, you know, it's, 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 it's first class. Uh, electrical facilities, but that's not necessarily the case. We do have occasions where the, the voltage will drop below nominal. Uh, and so, and we were having a lot of issues with those products when they first came to market because of that. Um, so we do have brownout, you know, protection for brownout conditions here, but here's the thing with, about, about brownouts. When you have a brownout condition, your voltage drops from nominal, say, to 208 or something like that, and it's down to uh, 180. Right? It's going to last for a little bit, and then it's going to recover. When that recovery happens, there's 99% of the time, there's a spike. And that spike is really what's going to kill your equipment. This is why I say, whether it's a ductless mini splits, VRF, or Ecor, whoever brand, always put a surge protector. It's going to save you a callback for sure. Or the air handlers, Kelly had mentioned. Um, with your regular um, air handler. We have an ECM motor in them. Nothing to write home about. Our technology happens in the outdoor unit. We can, our air handlers can be installed upflow, downflow, horizontal right, horizontal left. Um, in terms of setup, right? So pretty standard, nothing that you're, you guys are not familiar with. We've got case codes again for, for, for those locations that have uh, furnaces. Pretty, pretty standard. Um, you get up to 17 SEER. Um, if you're using somebody else's uh, case coil and their furnace with our unit, you're probably going to hit about 16 SEER. Any of the, we have any installers in here? Anybody do an install? Any of your wonderful salespeople have ever ordered a horizontal coil when it was supposed to be vertical? <laughs> never. Did that ever happen? Well, those coils are multi-positional, so that's not a worry anymore. And it's rated in horizontal and vertical format. So we've made it a little easier for your salespeople to scroll over that. And it's, it's literally two screws that you need to remove, slide it out, and slide it right back in. Very, very easy. I mean, I'm not calling out that. <laughs> <laughs> Um. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, John. All right, we, one of the things we have, we have problems with, we always have to take the, access, the ladder access out again. 90% of the time, we've got to take that damn thing down. 17 and a half inch from 21 inch coils. That's, yeah. I was just looking at that. Yeah, we can get you a 24 yeah. and a half inch, but we're not really excited about bringing a 24 and a half inch in the market. So we're looking at 17 and a half inch and 21 inch. Man, that is awesome. Right. Awesome. So, pretty, pretty, pretty um, s small. Why keep doing this? Rick, you, you saw this, this, um, this slide on Rick's presentation with our, the higher SEER rating and the, the SEER that you get, SEER HSPF uh, information that you get with our product. I'm not going to spend much time on it. You're not going to remember this anyways. You'll have it. Again, anything that you see here in terms of this information, you can access on our website. You can also access this information on the app, the Equal app. There's a, and I'll show you. I'm going to connect my phone to the presentation so that you guys will get a feel for what, you know, the information that you have in the app as well. But, your browser. Mm? Your browser. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, 
Jonathan mentioned uh, T-STAT, right? So there's, we, we have an ECR thermostat, um, or inventory right now is, you know, Rick's not in the room, but quite low at, at this point, so I'm not sure you guys will be able to, to get any um, uh, now, but we've got a couple features on the thermostat that are, are pretty unique, right? Um, the first one I'd like to mention is that in certain markets where you, you have traditional AC installation setups, going out to the outdoor unit, you only have two wires, right? Because you don't, you don't have a reversing valve to energize. Um, so, or you may have three wires, right? Um, but to run, to run a heat pump, you're going to need another wire for your reversing valve. With the ICRO unit, um, T-STAT, you can run that heat pump with just those two wires. You don't need to run a third wire out. You know, I, I've had guys out in the field say, oh, you know, we can hack it the system by using the copper wire, um, the, the copper tubing um, to, 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 to energize. We don't recommend that because if you have a, 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 an electrical event, you could cause some issues there. Um, so the safest way to do it is to, would be to use a, a thermostat that will get you heat pump function without having to run that third wire out to the outdoor unit. And or, or TSTAT does that. We also have um, a, a, a G2 terminal on our, on our uh, air handler that allows you to actually, typically our unit is a, is a single speed motor. It's an ECM, but it's, you set the speed, you want a high, high, low, medium speed, you set the speed, and then the unit's gonna run at that speed. But with our thermostat, we can improve our latent heat performance, right? The amount of dehumidification that happens um, with the unit by lowering the blower speed, right? You, you have two ways of actually improving the, the latent heat performance of your product. Um, the first and most common way is to slow down the blower speed so that you get the air passing over the coil more times and more, each time it passes that coil, it extracts more moisture and you get you know, a drier environment, feels nice and, nice and cool inside or you can lower the, the saturated evaporating temperature of that coil. You can drop the coil temperature so low that the air passes over it one time and it's gonna extract maximum amount of, 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 uh, of moisture, right? Because you're almost instantly freezing that, that air. So you're, you're getting it nice and cold, it's gonna start sweating a lot faster. We employ both tact, uh, ways with our product, right? If you have, let's say you're using somebody else's air handler and it's a fixed speed air handler and they have um, high humidity, you wanna extract that humidity. We have a setting on our unit that's called dehumidification, right? And what that does is we drop the saturated evaporating temperature of the coil from 45, somewhere there, to about 28. So we're lowering to below freezing is where your saturated evaporating temperature is because you're, you're throttling much less refrigerant through that coil. So you're making the coil really, really cold, so it extracts the, 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 the humidity really, really fast. But again, these, these are communicating systems. So you guys might say, then Winston, what's gonna happen if the coil is so low, temperature is so low, you're gonna load that coil eventually with ice. It's gonna start freezing up and then you're gonna have you know, more problems. But because we have these temperature sensors that are looking at the refrigerant system constantly monitoring to see where we are. Once it sees those conditions starting to happen, it's gonna exit that mode, it's gonna warm up the coil a little bit so you don't load that coil and then it's gonna go back and start operating that way again. So the thing with not just our inverter system, but most of these inverter systems, they are communicating. A traditional unit, you won't find these, these temp sen temperature sensors all around the system, right, because <laughs> those units don't care what's going on. The unit is just running full blast as soon as you turn it on, and it's gonna to continue to do that until the, the thermostat says turn off. But with these systems, they're modulating. They're always looking and getting feedback as to what's going on. That's why there's this huge PCB on the outdoor unit. I did have uh, one question on the prior slide. Mm -hmm. Which one? The CFMs, so like on the five ton, mm -hmm. you know, I'm saying like a max airflow of only like the 1590. Mm -hmm. So you're still like one ton of air below a five, because like if you do the normal 400 per ton, mm -hmm. is that how y'all are getting the 17 sear? 
partially. But this idea of um, CFM per ton, again, is a legacy. Um, um, it, it's based on fixed speed product, you know, running, a compressor running at a, 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 a fixed speed. If you, if you look at, um, just to make it a bit more practical, if you look at a ductless mini split product, right? You could have an 18,000 BTU um, mini split product and install it in a, in a thousand square foot space, for example. That unit is gonna run at high speed when it first starts out. And then as the, 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 the load condition, you know, yeah. comes down, yeah, that fan is gonna start. So it's not running always at 400 ZFM per ton, mm -hmm. right? Because your compressor, the tonnage of your compressor is not always fixed. The tonnage of your compressor varies according to your load. So, you know, it, it was some, we, we have to kind of unlearn some of those things. It, it's good, it's a good base, but with these inverter type systems, you're gonna get much better efficiency, much better, and, and this, this fixed, uh, these fixed conditions. Similarly, you know, in the same vein, when you look at line sets, right? That's also a big thing when you're doing a swap out, right? If it's an existing system and you're doing a swap out, you have a, a fixed line set there that you generally, if it's, it's through the wall or through some slab, you can't change. And then you get a question, oh, you, I need this size line set, I need that size line set. Okay. With our unit, you have variability in the line set because you have the, the inverter system that's gonna vary. With a certain line set, if you have a compressor putting a certain, running at a certain um, flow rate, that line set can't expand or contract, right? So the compressor, and the compressor can't do anything but run at 100%, so you're gonna have issues. But with our system, with inverter type systems, that compressor varies. There's a caveat to that, though. You're not running 516's line set on the liquid line. Anymore. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, there's a limit. The realm of, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> right, there's a limit to that. I'll get the call next week. <laughs> right, right, there's a limit. Um, I have a slide here that kind of tells you the, the, the optional line size uh, as well, but there's a limit. I mentioned the, the, the sound level of our product. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're you know, running down about 56 dBA, uh, as low as we can go. And you'll hear it when you go outside, right? Yeah, very, very low. Or you won't hear it. Or you won't hear it. That's right. Um, the, the app, we're going to get more into this, but just to show you a quick overview of the app, we've got three main pages. We've got one that shows systems. And the systems, the systems page shows the equipment that you've, you've actually, shoot, the equipment that you've installed. So your units would be here. Anything that you or your company install, if you're on the same, um, uh, the same app, you're, you'll see all, all the equipment here. Any kind of um, notices will show up. You've got uh, an indicator. This unit went off based on some fault, a fault, which is why it's red. This one just cycled off because it met condition. You have another one that shows uh, events. You click on, you, you're going to, you choose any one of these and go into events and it's gonna show you show you any kind of event that there, is, that there was on the product. And then you have files. Remember I told you before, you have your service manual, your data submittal sheets, installation manual. We even have videos there. So that auto charge feature, how to auto charge the unit, you can actually watch the video while you're on the job site. Um, anything that you need, any, 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 any kind of error codes that you need are also here that you need to, to be able to troubleshoot. The unit can be configured. Each unit leaves the factory set up as a heat pump, right? So in a heat pump, you have an H in the nomenclature, the name. But if you were to actually flip the dip switch on this product and make it a cooling only unit, almost instantaneously on your app, you're gonna see that, C, that H turn to a C. We actually had a case in Orlando where a, a contractor installed a product uh, in the summer and either him or one of his helpers changed the dip switch to C, to a cooling only unit. And he called our tech support center in November and said, hey, my homeowner, the unit worked fine in the summer, it cooled quite well, and in the, now in the winter, I need heat and it's not heating. I think I need a new reversing valve. I need a reversing valve. The reversing valve is not working on the product. We pulled up the system. Uh, they had an IoT gateway, so we pulled up the system in our, in our and within, a second, we told him, hey, your unit was configured as a cooling only. Just switch, dip switch, 
and, you're, and it'll be a heat pump. He did that, and you started heating immediately. He was ecstatic. But that's a, a he, would, he would have probably, had it not been an ECOR unit with the IoT gateway that we could see, he probably would have gone out, changed a, a perfectly good reversing valve and spent hours, charges customer if, if you know, for, 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 for no reason. We also had, you know, an, a case where a contractor called us, and I think, Kelly, you had mentioned uh, something to that effect, where a contractor called us and said, the homeowner called him and said the unit hadn't worked for like a week, right? The unit, he needed a new PCB on the, on the unit because the unit hadn't worked. And he was actually at the job site calling us. We pulled up the system, it had an IoT gateway, we could see that unit had ran probably four or five hours before he got to the job site. So we knew it was working fine. Um, he didn't have to change the PCB. There was absolutely nothing wrong with the unit. He needed a thermostat. And you know, that saved the homeowner and him uh, 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 you know, a time and money. On, on the unit, you, on the, the dashboard of the product, you're able to see high pressure, low pressure, um, running amps, if the unit is running in cooling mode, you can actually see the speed of the compressor, um, discharge, superheat, just about anything that you need. I think this product, this, this is my unit. Um, and at the time I had it, I'm in Miami, I had it set up as a cooling only unit. I've now, had, I now have it running as a heat pump. But at the time, it's a five ton unit I have, and this was the BTU that it was putting out at the time I looked at it. So if you have it set for four ton, it would show dash 48? Yeah, if you have it set for four ton, it's gonna show a dash 48 here. So you'll, you'll know. Yeah, it's a simple dip switch, and we'll, we'll show you exactly how to do that. Uh, we have a tech support um, center in Miami where you guys can call in, ask questions. The guys will be able to pull up the unit for you, look at some of the history, help you walk through what's going on. Um, we are, we're, we're, app, it'll also have that phone number in there, too, so it's about there and a half. Yeah. We're, we're, we're expanding the team as we get more of you guys on board. Um, we're, we're growing the team, uh, making it bigger so that you, we can respond to you guys, um, you know, first time out. But if you were to call in and the, the lines are occupied, you press that you request a callback, the very next tech that's available, the system is going to make an automatic outbound call to you. So you're going to get a callback. So you don't have to sit there on the line waiting for someone to call you back, as long as you choose that option that, that you know, you need a callback. Um, a year year and a half ago, you didn't even have to choose a callback. If you called in and then hung up the phone, somebody's going to call you back. But the volume has grown so much that now we've asked, you know, we're asking you guys just to select the callback option and then someone calls you back. Hey, what's the what's hours? Our hours of operation? The hours of operation are 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern. 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 Okay. Yeah. So with our IoT gateway, you get you know, 24 hour monitoring, you get live system updates, you get remote startup diagno diagnostics. I like to give examples of some of the, the, the real cases that we've had, you know, with, with, with some of the services, especially the monitoring that we, we provide. We had a case in, I think, two years ago. You remember when we had a polar vortex in the, in the, in the north, Midwest, temperatures were very, very low. We had one rep that had a system in his house and the unit was not performing. He couldn't keep up because outdoor temperature had gotten so low that week. He called us and said, hey, my unit can't keep up. Is there anything that we can do? We were able to remotely log into a system, change the unit from standard operation to high performance operation. So it improves the, increases the, the performance of the unit about 20, 20%. And he was able to actually satisfy his, his uh, heat, heat requir heating requirement. I can tell you, he's a seller of equator for life. That experience alone, you know, was, was, was outstanding for him because he didn't have to have a tech come out and, and adjust anything on a unit. We were able to do it remotely. Um, and he could instantly feel the difference in the product. 
Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through the, the, the engineering aspect of, of this product, but um, i like to point out that even though it's a DC uh, system, sometimes when you do checks on a product, the, the, the guys may ask you to set your, your meter to AC um, to check certain things, right? Even though it's DC. Um, and that's because the unit is running on a simulated AC current. Right? So an AC, or AC current looks like this, right? It's, it's sine wave. DC is usually a flat line. Um, but what we did is, because we want to be able to vary the speed of the motor and the compressor, we actually took the AC, we took the AC, um, made it DC, and then turned that DC back to AC, but in such a way that we can actually vary the amplitude of that sine wave. So we can vary how much that unit will run in terms of speed um, and the compressor. That's uh, just a little. Um, here, uh, this is a, a quick slide that kind of shows the difference between uh, an inverter system, how it will ramp down and try to maintain, versus just running at the same speed and overshooting uh, and cycling on and off. So sometimes, actually, you may find homeowners who um, and actually, uh, a neighbor two doors down from me bought one of these units, right? Uh, he's, he came, saw my unit, said he wanted one, he bought it. And then within a week, he came to me and he was like, hey, Winston, you know, my unit runs longer than my older unit. You know, it doesn't cycle on and off as, as, as quickly. And so I had to explain to him this uh, phenomenon, that his old unit, the compressor was running at 100% every time. So it's going to run, and then it's going to hit temperature, and then it's going to cycle off. And then once the, the, the temperature falls, it's going to start again, and it's going to run 100%, and it's going to cycle off. But with an inverter system, it runs. They start out at the same place, right? But then it, and actually, they don't start off at the same place, because this unit is a soft, soft start unit. That's also another key thing about inverter type systems, is that with traditional units, a lot of times you need a hard start kit, because it takes so much current to actually get that motor turning, that you need to put a, a booster to get that compressor to actually go. With inverter type system, usually they start slow, and then they ramp up, and then they go all the way up to, to meet demand, and then they start coming back down and modulating, right? But if we, if we look at the, the cycle somewhere further in, you'll see that the unit's going to run, but it's going to keep running longer. This unit has cycled off here, right? The on-off unit, it's cycled off here already. But the inverter type unit is still running because it's, all it's done is that it's slowed down. So I had to explain to him, hey, you're, you're, you're using less energy, not starting on and off, because every time you start off, you're pulling maximum amps. Your starting amps are pretty high. But with, with an inverter type product, it's just maintaining. And if you look at the, amp, the current draw on these units, you'll see sometimes five amps, eight amps, you know, four amps, very low, depending on where you are. Uh, in your cooling or heating cycle. You guys want to take a break or? Show of hands. Anybody want to take a short break? All right, we'll keep going. This, th these are examples of some of the, some of the other products out there uh, in terms of what their inverters look like. And you know, if I were to look at this product for the first time, I'd probably be a, a little bit, you know, gun shy to go to put my hand in here and, and try and fix anything, right? Because it, it, it's scary, actually. Um, this unit um, is, a, is a very neat unit, I must admit. You know, pretty clean design. But one call out I have in this unit is this right here. This is a, uh, a, a process tube that's used to cool the inverter board. So they're actually taking some of the refrigerant, the cool refrigerant, and they're actually running it through this tube and it actually keeps the board clean, uh, cool, because these, these units have a, a board that he, the PCB he, he overheats, it'll fail. The thing, the thing with this, though, is that every time you have to change this PCB, you have to bend this tube out of the way to get to that PCB, if you ever have to change it. And eventually, you could have a fatigue failure, or you could kink the line. Um, this is our board. We don't have that. We have a heat sink on the back side of the board sitting up here in the airstream of the, the condenser fan. 
so you never have to worry about you know, bending a refrigerant line or anything like this. Like I said before, it's six screws, and you pop this thing out and put a new one in. Very, very service-friendly uh, approach to the product design. You guys might, might, some of you guys might be familiar with these two. Um, you need a divorce, my friend. my girl right there in the middle. This is too well. I must call out, I don't see any of my filter over here. So you're susceptible to some performance issues. Before the, before the electricity goes anywhere, we have an inductance ring. Make sure that the current, is, the communication, the current only flowing one way in our system. So there are, you know, more than a few upgrades between here and here. I leave it at that. <laughs> um, yeah, again, these are the components, pretty simple, pretty simple. We're going to go look at the unit outside. You guys will get to see it. Um, these are the, the temp sensors that we have in the unit. These are the key components. The temperature sensors, the thing with inverter type units, the, 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 the main things to look at in terms of uh, system performance are uh, the, the, the temperature sensors. Everything else are safety devices uh, on an inverter system. It's generally the temperature sensors. If the unit is, is underperforming or overperforming, uh, a lot of times you can trace it back to a temp sensor, right? So what we've actually done with our system is that we've made some of the temp sensors redundant, meaning that if one temp sensor fail, the unit will continue to operate for a certain period of time until you get a chance to go and change that temp, temp sensor. With, with many other systems out there, if the temp sensor fails, the unit is blind. It can't see. Uh, it doesn't know what it needs to do, so it's going to shut down. But we've actually made our unit in such a way that if one fails, the unit will still operate. It starts, it starts to look at the upstream and downstream temp sensor to be able to interpolate where the middle one, the one that failed, should be. And your customer still get to continue using that product. Um, you know, while you, you go out and, and get the, 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 the replacement sensor. We've got a high pressure and low pressure switch. We've got an accumulator. Uh, we also have a, 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 ref, a refrigerant receiver tank in the unit, again, because it's a heat pump. And because of the, the, the possible long line sets, we have a pretty large receiver tank in the uh, refrigerant receiver tank in the, in the outdoor unit. Um, we've got an EEV in the outdoor unit as well. So you've got two metering devices in the system. You've got an electronic expansion valve in the outdoor unit, and then you have your traditional TXV on the indoor unit. The TXV is used when you're cooling. In your cooling mode, it's your regular TXV that, that's in any AC system. And then in your heating mode, the refrigerant is being throttled at the outdoor unit EEV, right? Um, so when in cooling mode, your EEV is, is, is running wide open when, when you're in cooling because you're not doing any uh, metering at that point. And then when in heating, it's a bi-flow uh, TXV, so the refrigerant is not being metered at the indoor unit, but your, your outdoor unit EEV is actually doing the throttling. So and we go aside and we look at all those things on the unit. Um, this is a refrigerant cycle in, um, in, 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 in cooling and in heating, we're not going to spend any time there. You guys are not going to remember that. But remember I told you that we've got 40 different stages um, in our, uh, on our compressor. So the compressor is going to run at different frequencies depending on your load condition, the load that's, the, that's called for in the indoor unit. It may start out down here. If, it's, if your temperature spread is very, very large, it's 82 degrees inside and you set your temperature for 61, the compressor is then eventually going to ramp all the way up. It's going to be running at, generally, it's going to be running at around 68, 70, 72 RPSs, rotations per second, is where it's going to run normally. And then it's going to start to cycle back down as your, the, the differential between your set temperature and your room temperature gets closer. That compressor is going to start to slow down. It's going to pull less amp and it's just going to maintain, right? These up here, beyond stage, say, 30 and four, up to stage 40, those stages are reserved for things like, remember I, I mentioned earlier high performance where, okay, my unit is really not hitting and it's very cold outside and I need to boost the, the performance a little bit. 
that's when we're going to call on these higher stages. We also call on these higher stages when the unit goes through an oil return mode, right? Um, generally, these units are going to run. Some oil will migrate from the compressor at some point and be sitting in the coils or the line set. The unit goes through pretty, periodic, uh, periodic oil return phases where it ramps up to a higher speed and force that oil back to the compressor and then start again. Anytime it's going through one of these stages, it's going to indicate that on your app. So you'll see that, you know, hey, it's going through these stages. Same thing with our outdoor fan. Outdoor fan, again, nine different speeds. And these speeds, you can, the, the unit will modulate through these speeds depending on your, your outdoor temperature, your set temperature, things like this. It's going to do it. But it also access these speeds, as Wes mentioned, when you have, you set the unit to like silent mode, night mode. And I think you guys are going to find that quite neat once we get to that slide and I, and I explain what it is. And then this is our, our EEV. The unit will go through defrost. So we've got, it's got um, um, a number of different defrost settings that you can actually set the unit to. Uh, if you're in Maine, for example, and you have high humidity and low temperature, you're going to need to go through a lot more defrost cycles, a lot more aggressive defrost cycles. You can set the unit to go through a higher, a more aggressive defrost. If you're here where your defrost cycles aren't as, as necessary, you can set the unit to run with, with less frequent defrost. So the unit stays in heating a lot longer and doesn't cycle through defrost as, as, as much as possible. Or you can have it set at a factory setting and it goes through defrost based on time, based on run time. All right, so, and these settings, you can actually set these, make these settings at the unit when you're commissioning the unit. Or let's say you set the unit up and you, you leave it in, in, in standard defrost, right? And you finish your job, you, you're your home, and your homeowner says, you know what, this unit is going through defrost too frequently. I, I'd rather have more heating cycles than defrost. You can pull up the app while you're watching football or your favorite TV show. You can pull up that unit, and you can change the setting on your app without having to make a truck run to that job site. When the unit is going to the defrost mode, do you have heat exchanger? The one is the supply you inside the house with the heat or no? When it's going to defrost, we can energize your heat strip okay. to, 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 to heat okay. while it's going through defrost. And actually, we've, we've also, and this is also another um, case of us updating the units after install. Um, when we first um, not only for it, but uh, uh, a couple cycles in, we had some, some contractors out in Missouri who were saying, hey, when the unit goes through defrost, when it exits defrost, there's a cold draft that happens, right? Because it's now back to, when it's going through defrost, it's, it's, it goes into cooling mode, right? So the coil is, the indoor coil is cold, and then when it starts heating again, it has to discharge that somewhere. So it, it dumps it in the house. The homeowner feels a draft. That was how the unit was designed we started saying, hey, okay, how can we resolve that issue? The, way, the best way to resolve that issue is to allow that heat strip to continue to produce heat even when the heat, heat, the heat pump starts running in heat pump mode, right? So you're still, while it's heating up the refrigerant, you're still heating up that cold air coming off the coil. The way we were able to do that was just update the software and tell the, 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 the system, hey, still provide 24 volt to that heat strip while the unit is in heat pump because before, we had it, if the heat strip's on, the heat pump's off. And we were able to do that by just updating the software. We didn't have to print a whole, you know, produce a whole bunch of boards and send to, to guys to go out to the field and make that change. You know, contractors love that because it's less truck run for them, right? It solves a problem without ha them having to go on the job site. This is where I was telling you our, our saturated evaporating temperature naturally is about 43. Um, and condensing 113, but if we, if we set the unit to, to dehumidification mode where we want to drop the, the moisture level real quickly on a fixed speed fan, we actually lower this temperature to about 28. Insulation. Insulation is straightforward. I'm not going to spend much time here on installation because, again, 
have any of you guys installed this product before? I think you guys have. Um, any comment in terms of ease, e ease of? Uh, Don't let the boss man have the app. That's the only thing I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's pretty straightforward. It's a heat pump, right? It has a huge uh, uh, electronic PCB inside. So where there's runoff, we'd rather you know, there be a gutter here or something so you're not dumping a lot of moisture in here because you could splash into the board. Even though it's well designed and insulated, we, don't, we still would prefer for it to, to be um, not necessarily just sitting there on a runoff. Huh? Even smaller. Yeah. That's the guy right there. That's um, questions. I was, yeah. was going to ask them, uh, whatever you have to break it down, like I know about good men's derivatives, you can't really like them. If you take them apart, the warranty goes out the window. Um, what if, like, I'm talking about the air handle? Yeah, the air handle. Can you take them out, like the i 16s and stuff like that? Like, can you break it down? Oh, I know yeah. some spots are like. You can't do it. Yeah. yeah. Break down in the yeah. 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 You can take the horizontal dividers out, squeeze them down, and get them in the edge. So the question was, can you break the air handler down if you got a tight attic space? Because some of the five-ton air handlers are pretty big, as mm -hmm. everybody knows. Mm -hmm. With these units, you won't void the warranty or anything. If you take out all the screws, accordion it, put it back up, and then build it back up in the attic, which I know everybody loves doing. Right. You have the capacity to do that if yeah. you want. Yeah, no, it's not, it's not going to void the warranty. And how about installation of the outdoor? Yeah, I mean, uh, the little LED is nice and tells you How would you compare that to some of the other products you sell? Um, they're nice, quiet, I'm happy, I like the size of them. They fit through gates and stuff like that. Great. Uh, the only thing was it's going to come with a filter. <laughs> That's the only thing. That's right. Yeah. Rick, Rick, comment. Um, the only thing is that they don't come with filter dryers. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, 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 one of the challenges when you when you see the other manufacturers include the filter dryer is the bracket that holds it down, the cap that holds it back and loose and they rattle around the side of the room and of course. Question back here. This uh this system is controlled by twenty four volts, correct? Correct. Twenty four volt control. Yeah. Okay. Two wires going to the outdoor condition. Right. We we have we have four wire uh Molex plug at the outdoor unit, and I'll show it to you in a little while. Um, but you can operate it with two, if it's a cooling only unit, yeah, two wires. Okay, okay. Yeah. Heat pump, heat three. With backup, yeah. Heat yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, can you use the Equiby Cheetah wire that comes with the Equiby units? If you don't have that third C wire? The, 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 the PEK, the, the, the power extending kit? Yeah, yeah you can. can. Okay, yeah. so then essentially if you have two wires, you can use that three wire cheater kit to get that. Uh, well, cool. yeah, yeah, so that's yeah, right. yeah. And then also, you can use a red link. You can use it? Red link? Uh, yeah. That's where we're still wondering how that's going to work. Red link could that's work, on the but pro we might have to do some testing. Yeah, that's, that's a 485 communication, right? Or it's 485 communication. I, I, I actually yeah, think, I don't know what red link is, the actual communication. Okay. Okay. But essentially, what's happening. Uh, I mean, it's gonna, you're energizing the two wires because the red link outdoor is outside or inside, but two wires. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, red link is communicating two back and forth between the two, the ERM, which is the equipment remote interface, and the uh, I, I don't know what the other one's called, EIM, which okay. is the one at the unit. So it's sending the signal, it's power, it's energizing and sending the signal that would normally happen through straight wire. It's just using a red link interface in between the two if you don't have those wires. I see. And we've used them on uh, two stage units, mm -hmm. so I think it should. It, it I think it should work. work. Yeah, we we want to test that before I give you a permit. Yeah. yeah. Now, if you guys buy like twenty of them and you want to try it out, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this doesn't necessarily apply to you guys so much, but for a heat pump, you know, up north, they have to have them installed on on elevated. Um, pads because it's a heat pump, right? And you don't want a snow drift to like block half the, the coil. So they have to be elevated. In Canada, they, they tend to put them on, on brackets, depending on where, where they are. Um, in Miami, in Florida, where we are, we are in a hurricane zone. So it's, uh, it's code that you have to have the unit tied down on a concrete pad. 
um, because of the where <laughs> or locate or geolocation. Um, in terms of line set, you have a, a hundred feet maximum line set length and 50 foot elevation, indoor unit above or indoor unit below. Um, that's your elevation spread that you have. Um, and line sets, your standard line sets, you can go 5 eighths, you know, 3 quarters standard, but you can go um, 5 eighths or 3 quarters, you can go uh, 3 eighths, you can go a quarter. So you do have some flexibility if you have uh, installed equipment with line sets sitting there that you don't want to change out or that it's impossible to change. So if we're replacing like an old R22 system, they're usually using the quarter, right? Mm -hmm. So now you have an option where you instead of before you were walking away and figuring out running line sets down the side of the house, mm -hmm. now you can pop this thing in, use that quarter inch mm -hmm. line set and not have to, you know, flush it please, but yeah. You yeah, you have, have to flush it. Does sure. it affect the efficiency well than that smaller line set? Uh, it's, it's not going to affect the efficiency. efficiency. So, and, and, and this information, again, is in the, the installation manual. So you guys don't have to remember this. Hey, with the Ikari unit, can I use this or can I use that? It's all there for you to use. And that installation manual is on the app. So you don't have to walk around with this book. Uh, I mentioned earlier that you have, you know, it, it, you have to have a, a search protector on the product. Um, it's, uh, I can't say enough about having a search protector. On this equipment. I can't um, say that uh, it's important enough that we don't have it to be able to turn on the failure to the power pipe to work. It will affect your warranty. Um, if you, if you don't remember, not just us, but I don't think there's a manufacturer out there that offers warranty on lightning strikes, electrical <coughs> surges, anything like this with their equipment. You may, you may be able to get that, the, the, the part replaced. But it's not an official. Now, is that, do you need a low voltage surge protector as well? No. no. Just, just, just a line voltage. Just a line voltage. voltage. Uh, yeah. Is that expensive? Yeah, I mean, I got like 40 different ones. Um, this is the, the, the T stop wiring. Comes in a, a, a four part Molex plug you C, Y, O, and W. The W wire is actually an output wire. Right? So this will, depending on the setting of the unit, it will output 24 volt to energize the relay for your second stage heat. Right? So it will only output 24 volt when you actually make that setting for it to output 24 volt. And you can tell it at what temperature you want it to output that 24 volt. So you could say, hey, if the temperature falls below 30 degrees Fahrenheit outdoor, that's when I want to initialize my, my second stage heat. And so I want to energize my relay using this W wire. There's, a, there's a, uh, a temperature sensor on the outdoor unit that's sensing the outdoor ambient temperature. And once it falls below that, then you're going to get 24 volt from here. Otherwise, you can say, hey, I don't want, I don't want it to ever output 24 volt, right? Because I'm, I'm never going to use it that way. I will use an auxiliary, auxiliary setting indoor unit and manually go change it to auxiliary heat. Um, these are just, you know, FYIs, frogs, snakes, you know. How about, I think we got a dual fuel application. How about dual fuel? Yeah. Where's that 24 fine. volt to kick on the It'll kick on, it'll kick on. And, and you'll tell, you can set the unit as to what temperature it should kick it on. And, you know, we'll, we'll go. And again, going back to the customizability of this product, the same thing. You, you could have one unit, one customer says, hey, I want my unit to turn on at minus 15. Another customer says, hey, I want mine to, to energize at 30 degrees. And you can set up same equipment, but you can have them set up completely different. Here is uh, dual heating just in time, JIT, right? Yep. Um, this is a wiring diagram. And then these are the different temperatures at which you can say, hey, I want to, to have 24 volt off this on this wire. The auto charge feature, the auto charge feature, I think, is, is a pretty, pretty neat um, setup on the product. This is, with this feature, again, as, as Rick had mentioned in, in his presentation, you hook up your line sets, you get all your equipment in place, you pull your vacuum, 
you release your refrigerant, and then you turn on the system. Right? You set your indoor temperature to the lowest temperature, and you press this BS4 button. What that BS4 button does is that it fixes the compressor speed. Because with inverter systems, what happens is as your set temperature um, gets close to your room temperature, that inverter is going to start slowing down. Right? Mm -hmm. So your refrigerant conditions will change. And if, so if you don't fix the speed, you, what happens is that you start chasing a moving target with regards to how much refrigerant you need to add, because the entire system is now moving. With the BS4 button, you actually lock that compressor speed. So you're charging just as you would a fixed speed compressor, because that compressor now is fixed. Is that not 100% of its capacity when you're charging it? It's, it's close to 100% of your, your nominal running capacity is where it's, it's fixed at. Right? Um, and, and, then, and then it actually it enters the auto charging mode. And once it enters the auto charging mode, you're going to see a coefficient here that changes. It takes probably about five, seven minutes. At first, it's going to start with two dashed lines. And then it, those dashed lines are going to change to numbers, and then it's going to start changing. I prefer to see this number start flashing between 0 0.5 and 0 0.6. Right? 0 0.5 is ideal, but um, me personally, I like to see you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, 0 0.6. At that point, I know the unit is, is perfectly charged. Right? This has to be done um, in the cooling mode first. You know, so you have to be in, in, in cooling. And the temperature should ideally be above 50 degrees Fahrenheit outdoor, right? ideally. Um, if, if you're in conditions that are outside of that, you can actually weigh the refrigerant in just like, you know, like normal. Right? Um, and the, on, on, the, on the system also, you can, while you're doing, you know, at the, at the end of the, this uh, process, you can actually go in and check your pressures, your high and low pressure, using these buttons and the LED at the outdoor unit as well. You can check your, your high and low pressure, you can check your subcooling and your superheat without having to connect gauges um, to the unit. Most, most guys like to put their gauges on anyways. I say go ahead. Um, it's quite fine if you do that, um, but you don't necessarily have to. The, similarly, we have a pump down feature. Um, this, is all, this, this is a bit more of the, 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 the uh, auto charge. But you remember I told you we, we, we charge the subcooling? So our target subcooling uh, is anywhere between 10, between 8 and say 12 degrees subcooling. If you're at 14 degrees subcooling, that's quite fine as well. Right, but the, the minimum target that the system is looking for when it's actually going through this auto charging is on the two, three ton unit, it's 10 degrees. And uh, on the, the, the four, five ton, is eight degrees. But if you're 12, you know, as long as there's a liquid seal, you're good. Auto pump down. I actually did this at my house um, because I made a classic mistake of installing a one-way filter dryer on the unit. So I had to, <laughs> so I had to, so I had to pump it down and, and, and change the filter dryer and then install it again. And actually, when I did it, I just used the, the, the unit itself, right? So you hit it, you hit uh, pump down mode, you, know, you close your discharge and you let it run, and it's going to start pumping down the refrigerant to the outdoor unit. And on this, what you're looking at here is actually the pressure, your low pressure. And it's going to keep going down. The unit will shut off at, if the, if the low pressure goes below 24 PSI, the unit goes into a fault stop, right? The, the low pressure switch is going to say, hey, stop the unit. So I, I let it run. It gets down. As soon as it starts getting closer to, to 24, I start closing the valve, you know, because the unit's going to stop if it goes below 24, and then the system is going to start equalizing again, right? So you're going to start losing that, that, that refrigerant back to the line set. So I start closing the valve as it got closer. Then I let it sit for a while, and it just enter um, auto charge again, and it pull the refrigerant, the, 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 the rest of it down, right? So it's it very, very handy um, feature. And, and in fact, you can, you can pump this down to the indoor unit, or you can pump it down to the outdoor unit. Obviously, you have, depending on the line set, you have more volume in the outdoor unit. 
um, to pull the refrigerant in. But if you, if, you, if you had enough line set, theoretically, if you had enough line set, you could actually do the same thing and have the refrigerant go to the indoor coil and the line set and, and, and make some changes on the outdoor unit. But you know, in practicality, you probably wouldn't have enough volume to hold all that refrigerant on the line set and indoor coil. I know where you can get it back here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something, that, something that you were talking about earlier about the size of the condensers. Mm -hmm. So you were saying a minute ago about a receiver. It is a receiver tank. Yeah. So since theirs has a receiver, that's why you can get away with such a smaller mm -hmm. size coil. Because without a receiver, that's where all your liquid is. So you have to make it bigger the more charge you have. Well, if you have a receiver, you can still get away with yeah. making liquid and then just having it stored in the tank. Right. You, you can still get pre-charged 25 feet of line set in a smaller cabinet because you have that, that, that receiver tank. Um, so we're pre-charged for 25 feet of, of line set. And if you have to go above that, it's 0.6 ounce per foot um, above 25 feet is what you'd weigh in. Um, and you can do this while you're in auto charging mode, right? So let's say you have more than 25 feet. You put it in auto charging mode, you let it run, you connect your refrigerant tank, obviously it's R14E, so you flip it upside down, and you add your refrigerant. And it's gonna, the, 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 the coefficient is gonna, is gonna continue to, to change while you add that refrigerant. And then once you get this 0 0.5, 0 0.6 starts alternating on the screen, then you shut your, uh, your tank off and you're good to go. So even if you're weighing the refrigerant in, you can still do it here. Uh, and here's a, a neat feature um, with our product as well. Generally, if you're, in a, if you're in a heating cycle, right, and your refrigerant level is low, um, a, a lot of times, Custom, guys will install products, and in the wind, summertime, the product cools fine, right? If you're low on refrigerant and cooling, you get away with it most times. You will not know. Your customers will, will not know unless the refrigerant level gets so low that you start loading up the coil with ice, right? You start freezing, or it's so low that you're not getting any cooling, or it starts to short cycle and you have high humidity. A lot of times, if it's, if it's, if it's a little undercharged, you will not know. Customer is going to feel cool anyways. It's unit cycling on and off. But when you go to the heat mode, it's going to become a lot more apparent because you need more refrigerant in heating than in cooling. So you will not get that high, high head pressure to get that temperature on the indoor unit. So you're going to have to add refrigerant. Or you need to check if your refrigerant charge is at the right amount. You can't use um, your normal superheat, subcool um, gauge to, to, to actually you know, to tell you if you're actually charged, properly charged or not. You can't add refrigerant um, um, so, so readily um, when you're actually running in heat pump mode. What we've got on our unit, I, I didn't show it earlier. Uh, I'm, let me see if it's here. I'm going to skip back a few slides. Let me see if it's on this one. It's here. So we've ha we have a third port here. So it's a true suction port, right? So whether you're heating or cooling, you're getting your true suction um, pressure here. So you can actually add refrigerant through this port when you're actually in heat mode. And to know whether or not your, your charge is correct, we put, we, on the app, we built in a gauge. So once the, you, 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 you can't, again, you can't look at superheat or so cool. The only way you can really tell is if you're looking at the compressor discharge superheat, right? Mm -hmm. Because your discharge superheat, whether you're in cooling or heating, you need to have a certain, um, at least 25, 30 degrees of discharge superheat to know that you're not flooding through that compressor, up to that compressor. Um, so we've actually built algorithm within the app that kind of gives you, uh, 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 you know, uh, some indication of whether or not you're actually properly charged. And it's in this, this tachometer kind of design. Once you're in the green area, you know that you're actually, your system is, is, is properly charged. If you look at your liquid line subcooling, right? Adjustable TXV. I always recommend adjustable TXV if you're changing out. Um, um, I, I did it one unit and I had, 
I, I think it was an, uh, an Aspen coil um, on the air handler side, fixed TXV. Um, I put a three ton outdoor unit with it, changed the, the TXV to an adjustable TXV, was able to, to, to adjust it, unit runs quite fine. Right? But the adjustable T TXV is key. The reason why it's key is because um, unless you're buying a, a, a TXV that is sized to that particular coil, you don't know what the, the minimum or maximum opening is for that, if it's fixed, right? Because um, even if e, uh, a fixed TXV, the, 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 the diaphragm, the, 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 the how much that, 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 that metering opens and closes, is, you can't change it. So if the maximum opening is this, it's, it's only going to open here. If the, if, the, if, the, if the minimum opening is this, it's only going to be here, right? Based on the bulb sensing. But when you have an adjustable one, you can actually change that to actually match the, the, the coil so that you get the right superheat. So if you're going to do a change out, always put an adjustable TXV because then you get to dial in the exact amount of refrigerant that you want to flow through that coil um, to, to maximize your efficiency. And, and we can, we, if the unit has an IoT gateway, we can help you do that. Because we can actually see this, you can do it you know, on the app, but we can actually sit in the office and we can see the system live as you're running it. And we can tell you, hey, you need to close a quarter turn clockwise or a, a, a quarter turn counterclockwise. And we'll, we'll let it run for five minutes, let the system stabilize, and then we can tell you, okay, go a little bit more or not. And we've actually done that on a number of occasions for guys out in the field who want to dial in the system and make sure that they're getting the best, the best out of it. Uh, the IoT device, the installation is very easy for me. <coughs> guys who have installed the part before, it's, it's, a, it's a one two job. Um, you know, unit comes with uh, a, a, couple of, a, a screw to, to a, attach it to the, the grill on the outdoor unit, and then the cable just sneaks, sneaks in and connects to the, uh, to the board. <coughs> the board, all the sensors are color coded. Um, the, 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 the Molex plug is color coded to the, 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 the receiver on the board. So it's very easy to know where, where which plug goes on the, on the PCB. You plug it in, you, you, you turn your power on, it's going to power up, it's going to boot up, it's going to search for the, the network, and it's going to start transmitting data. Once it starts transmitting data, then the, the blue LED is going is to flash. It has three LED and they're all going to light up initially. And then it's going to start stepping down until the blue LED is flashing. Blue LED is flashing, it means that it's actually transmitting data, and we can actually see the, see the product. If you're unsure, you can always call us and say, hey, you know, I just installed this unit. Can you guys see it? You will also know, because if you, can, if you can see it on the app, then we can see it as well. If you can't see it on the app, likely we won't be able to see it either. But if you're unsure, you can always give us a buzz, and we let you know. Um, Rick mentioned uh, installing the product. We, there, I, I suggest, even if, you, if, even if you don't buy one of our products, right? if you don't install our product, I suggest you install the app. Um, in anticipation of installing the product. <laughs> right? It makes it so much easier when you do that. Because as Rick mentioned in his presentation, the, 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 the registration of the product is a one-two job. You don't have to worry about going back to, to, to your office and filling out any, any documentation or logging on to, to the manufacturer's portal and filling anything. It's all done real live um, you know, in, in real time. If you do the app beforehand, you have to assign an app manager, uh, someone who's managing the app at your particular company. So it'd be one person. If you don't do it, if, <coughs> there's a couple steps to get the app registered so you become a registered service provider and everything. If you do it before you go out to the customer site, you're going to look far more professional. And quite frankly, your life's going to be a lot easier. So I just recommend doing it. Uh, whether you buy a system or not, which we all know everybody in this room is interested, so try to buy one. But having the app and being ready to do the install by just having the app ready is a lot easier than having to pull up some information that's external to what you would typically be carrying as a service mm -hmm. technician or even as an owner. So we, just a little bit of forethought will make your life far more pleasant on your first install. Yeah, absolutely. So there, there are two apps in the, in the App Store. 
there's a service pro app and an Iker home. One, it's for a Wi-Fi TSTAT, and then one's for, for guys like yourself. That's a service pro. That's the one that you want to you wanna have. Um, you download it. The Iker home, again, is for the, the or TSTAT, and then this one's for you guys. Once you download it, you're going to um, enter an email, an email address, and then you're going to click um, create an account. And then you're going to get an email back to you, an email address that you entered, and you're going to enter with it with a password, with a temporary password. You're going to enter that information here and sign in. Once you sign in, it's going to ask for some information, your name, uh, first name, last name, um, license number, things like this. You don't have to put uh, a contractor license information in there. right? Some jurisdictions require a contractor's license to install these products. Some jurisdictions don't. Um, so here, you have to have a contractor's license of so whoever would be the administrator. So then everybody else would sign up as an employee. Right. So the administrator will have a barcode, and then each employee scans that barcode and automatically gets all your company information to their phone, mm -hmm. and then that way you can yeah, so the administrator would sign in as a, uh, I'm the boss slash administrator, right? They, they would choose this option. And then anyone else who works on their team would, would don't, when they're registering, they, they, would be, they would select, I'm an employee. And what this does is it allows the, the administrator to, to see all the, the, the jobs of the guys on the team, right? Or girls on the team. Um, but it, it, you get a chance to see uh, the folks that are on the team and any product that they install, you're able to actually share that information. And, and they can actually reassign a certain job or, or a piece of equipment to somebody else in the team if they need uh, a service run on that job. Uh, and again, you, see the, you've, you guys have seen this slide where you get all the, the, the main system information. I showed you that slide. But you're, in, you're registering a product, right? You install the equipment. Everything is in place. You go in and you, you click Add a Unit. Right? You add, when you go add the unit, it's going to ask you to enter some homeowner information because this is a, your, it's a contract between you and the homeowner, right? as well as ECOR. Um, you're going to fill in the, their relevant information, name, address, state, phone number, things like this, and an email address. We require an email address for the homeowner because once this registration process is complete, they're going to get an email from ECOR welcoming them to ECOR family, explaining the warranty to them so that they know this is you know, they're on board. There's no question calling you back. Hey, was my unit registered or anything like this? Because they're going to get real, uh, real-time uh, communication directly from, from us. Hey, Winston, mm -hmm. that also applies to the Lego warranty. Once, it's, once you're registered on there, you will also, they will also get an email from you. Right. The labor right. So, so it, you know, it completes the, the communication cycle um, between you, warranty, and your homeowner. Your CSR is going to love that. You know, because they're not having to input all this and they're not getting the wrong email or the wrong phone number. I mean, everything's being done by the customer. Right. Why are you in front of them? Right. It's a far more accurate and mm -hmm. having to fix those is not fun. So. Right. And speaking of accuracy, when you're registering the product, you're not writing any serial number down and then re entering it somewhere else. You're scanning serial numbers with the app. So everything is automatic. Um, there are barcodes, QR codes on the unit. The first thing you, you're going to register is, the, is the, the IoT gateway. You just, you, there's a, a scanner button right next to the label IoT. You, 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 you click that, it opens the, the camera on your phone, and you scan the QR code, and it's going to capture the serial number. You do the same thing when you go to the outdoor unit. You click that, that, that scan button, it's going to open your camera, and you, you scan any one of the... the four or five serial number barcodes that are on that outdoor unit, on the carton or inside on the unit itself. You scan it, it's going to capture the serial number. So you don't have to worry about mistyping or miswriting a serial number and trying to figure out what you wrote when you were on that job site. It's already there. Same thing with the air handler and the case coils. Is there another location of the QR code for the I IoT gateway? Yeah. No, it's just that one. So if it gets sun faded, and we're in year seven, and I need to like look up history or anything. It's in your app. It's in your yeah, app. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's in the, the app. homeowner's name or the address. Yeah, yeah, we can find it. So what if I'm not the original contractor? <coughs> the, the address. You're at that address, though, right? Well, what if I'm not the original contractor? 
maybe I'm on the website, so then the customer got my name, said F you to the original, and then no, the Well, all they need to do is give you, give you their address. Okay. Where, where the equipment is, mm -hmm. that will be the system. It is Fair. absolutely dust and poop. I ain't just asking. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't just asking. So you have it there. And then once you fill in all that information, um, you're going to confirm your registration, right? Certain things you can also add. You can add if you have heat strip, you can put heat strip information there as well that you have in the system. Um, and the way we use that information is we also do an estimate. We're, 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 we're collecting data on the efficiency for you guys to use later on. So we can give you how many kilowatt hours the unit ran um, for a certain period, heating or cooling cycle or year, and we can tell you an estimated energy use, energy cost. You know, obviously, energy cost differs from region to region based on your, lo your local um, kilowatt per hour rate, but we can give you an estimate of how many kilowatt hours the unit ran and what the homeowner's um, energy uh, utility bill would have been for running the AC. Uh, and we use this information for that as well. Um, I think Rick had mentioned about the warranty, that we're very generous in our warranty in that with, with our product, um, with, with our manufacturer's product, if you install just the outdoor unit with somebody else's air handler, you get no warranty, right? With our equipment, you do get warranty if you just do a change out of the outdoor unit. You can get up to 10 year, 10 year warranty on that equipment if it's registered, has an IoT gateway um, with the system, and if that air handler that you're installing it with is a new air handler, you get 10-year warranty, right? right. If, it's a, if it's an existing air handler, you get five-year warranty. So the homeowner still gets warranty on that piece of equipment, even though they're only changing out one part of the equipment. It's not the full system. Right? You're not going to like do a warranty on a carrier toy. We're not, we're not warranting the, the, the indoor unit. Okay. We're only warranting our equipment. Like, like, but a lot of manufacturers will not even give you warranty on their equipment right. if, you don't if it's not a matching system. Right? So we do that, and we can do that because of the IoT gateway, because of the monitoring, because we're making sure that when you install that product that it's done correctly from the get-go. If it's a new uh, air handler and you want to qualify that for that, 10-year uh, warranty, you have to pr provide proof that it's a brand new piece of equipment that you're in installing on the indoor unit. One of the ways that you can do that, and do not try to cheat, is you take a picture. We have a camera here where you can actually take a picture of your invoice, and it's going to upload that to the system, right? Uh, we're going to need the model number and the serial number of that piece of equipment as well, and we'll be able to, to extend the 10-year warranty for the full matchup. So we're giving you guys flexibility. Um, because we, we have confidence in our equipment. You know, it was designed primarily for the change-out market. Um, so that it, it was fundamental that we were able to do this. Here's, here's another um, thing that came from a training session just like this one. Actually, a number of training sessions just like this one. When we first came to market with a product, we were, you, you guys were able to actually see the information on the app in terms of how the unit was set up, you know, what, how it was that, is it in dry mode, you know, what's the, at what temperature did you set the unit to stop the heat pump and, and energize your 24 volt for your auxiliary heat, for your dual fuel, right? At what temperatures did you have the unit commissioned for your silent mode and things like this? You, you're able to see it, but you weren't able to actually make changes remotely. And in a, in a training session just like this, a couple of guys says, hey, but if we can see it and you have this app, why don't you give us the ability to actually make changes and, and adjust the, these settings remotely without having to go on the job site? And we thought, ha-ha, why didn't we think of that? We took it back to the, to the guys, um, the, the, the R&D guys, and they were able to make the change. All we had to do was send out to the board, to the PCB, and the system was now able to actually receive information from the app to actually make changes remotely. So this, this, this upgrade feature actually came from, from guys just like yourselves. Um, so here, this unit actually, it's, 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 you know, you're only able to make changes to product that you install, right? Um, and I'll demonstrate that using Rick's phone um, 
you know, connected to the presentation, so I, I'll show you um, how that's done. But you can actually go in and, and, and make changes, and I'll explain some of those. These changes, all these settings that you can do here, you can actually do on site using the dip switch. So there's a, uh, the LED on the outdoor unit. You can actually change it from standard to dry mode to high performance mode. All right, you can change it. You can do the silent mode setup. But if you've already commissioned the unit, you have it running in, a, in, a, in, an, in an area. We had one case in Maryland where someone installed uh, just our outdoor unit, and it was set up to run in standard mode. It was a printing office, and he called us, and he says, hey, you know, the customer is having humidity issues. Can we do something? We switched it to dry mode remotely, and he didn't get another call back on that particular problem. So the, this is, is, is a, a nice feature for, for you guys without, where you can make changes to the product after you've commissioned it and left the job site without having to go back uh, on that job site. In the app, you can actually see, Rick mentioned, you can see up to 60 days of, of performance uh, history on the product. So you can go back and see how that unit ran. We can tell if a unit is short cycling, right? Because you can go back 60 days and you can look, hey, on this day, on these days, on these days, what, you know, what was the outdoor ambient temperature? You know, how, how, how long did the unit run before it, the compressor cycled off each time? And you can tell, those things will tell you things about whether or not, you know, you have a filter issue, you know, dirty filter, where you don't have enough, enough airflow. You can tell, you can, a whole bunch of stuff, things you can tell just by looking at the history of the product. Um, we've had cases where we've, um, let me see, towards the end. Towards the end, I'll show you some examples of where we've seen cases where someone installed a unit with a, um, with, with a microchannel coil, right? And how do you know there's a microchannel coil? Again, these are, this is an inverter system, so what happens is the unit is always looking to protect itself, right? I mentioned that earlier. So if it sees high pressure up top, the compressor, the first thing the compressor is going to try do is going to limit its, its, the, the, the frequency. So it's going to hit the limiter and it's going to say, hey, the pressure is too high. I'm not going to run at full blast. I'm going to run at minimum pressure, minimum uh, RPS, so I don't kill myself. And there's nothing you can do to, to, to change that. No matter what you change, you won't be able to change unless you remove that coil. So looking at some of these things will, will help you, you know, and that's how we help to diagnose exactly what's going on in the field as well. So um, I'm going to show you. Field settings. Critically on, on this unit, there are basically two dip switches that you need to um, be concerned with. The first, the first dip switch is dip switch number two. And this is where you actually select the, the capacity of the unit. If you want it to run as a two ton, three ton, four ton, or five ton. Um, like I mentioned at the onset, I prefer to leave the units in the higher tonnage because the system will modulate to meet the load. Um, th this is my, my you know, personal preference. Um, if your indoor unit is sized properly, um, then the outdoor unit will, will, will meet, will meet that, that load demand. Um, but if you so choose, you can choose, you know, if you wanted to run it as a two ton, three ton, four ton, or five ton. And you can select, depending on the position of dip switch number, number three, if you want it to run as an AC only or a heat pump. Right, um, and then the IoT response, I would say, just leave it factory, meaning that we're we're able to see the product um, if it's in the on position. Remember, I told you guys about the the temperature setting, the temperature sensors, and the fact that we allow the unit to continue to operate even with a failed temperature sensor. This is not something that you're going to find in most inverter type systems in the market today. If a sensor fails a lot of them are going to shut down because it's going to still run error code. Um, if you guys have experience with ductless mini split system, if the sensor goes bad, you're going to get an error code immediately, and that unit's not going to run. Um, with our system, we actually you know, built in some, some uh, leeway, whereby certain critical sensors, they have very short you know, run time. You know, we're giving you up to seven days on these uh, sensors where if, the, if they fail, you're going to get a notification that the sensor failed, but you have seven days to actually change it. 
right? Some of the, the less critical ones, you have up to 120 days. We will continue to operate with it at failed sensor, but we need you to go out and make, those, make that change. The reason we're doing this is because we want your customer to always have heat or cool if this equipment is installed and they're calling for it to give heat and cool. So if something fails, they should still be able to feel comfortable while you go and get that part and get them, you know, and get them situated. But they're not going to be out of uh, uh, any, the, the equipment while uh, a component is down. So if the system goes down and we get out there five days after it's gone down, it's still functioning, once we're on site, can we reset that and give them another seven days? Uh, no, we can. You can? Yes. Okay. And we have. Awesome. Yeah. We actually had a case where a contractor, he, had, he was actually, he got a notification. He didn't do anything. He didn't make any changes. Um, there was like two days left. And we called him, and he said he was actually out of state picking up his kid from college. And he wouldn't be back on site if we could extend it, and we extended it so for him to get back on site. Not something that we like to do, but we can do it in an emergency. Yeah, I feel like, hey, you know, it's yeah. going again. I mean, yeah, 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 exactly. exactly. Are those sensors calibrated a certain way so if they're fixated on the specific point? Yeah, so, so most, most of them are 10K. Um, so they're I not mean, interchangeable at all? If you oh, the only, only one, one, only one, one is the discharge temp sensor is it? Because it's, it's a higher um, ohm reading, right? But well, the other ones are, are the same. The discharge, discharge temperature sensor is a totally different sensor. Oh. So um, effectively, you could be carrying one sensor that would handle every one except for that discharge temp sensor? It's the length of the wires the same. Yeah. No, 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 I, no, no, I, I think, think it's best to have a different one. So we have to, to get that specific sensor. sensor yeah. Okay. That, that's what I'm getting at. Because on a, you know, when we're running you know, yeah. late night, you know, we got to get this taken care of. What can we do to fix it as a technician? We don't have the part available. You know? Here's the beautiful thing. You've got, seven, you've got seven days. So it's never an emergency emergency, unless you make it an emergency, a last day emergency, right? So we're giving you this leeway so that you, don't, you never have to say, oh, my customer's going to be down or my customer's down right now. I need to run out there. Unless you procrastinate and then you make it an emergency, right? Which, you know, we, we don't want. And the app will tell you which sensor has failed. Huh? The app will tell you exactly which exactly. oh, sensor. So yeah. we can go stop at the firehouse and then And say, yeah, yeah, I need that. Yeah, yeah. It'll tell you which sensor. Yeah, it'll stop at Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> and Johnson, these are some of the sensors that you're going to have a song of. Somebody needs to find it. I'm sorry? Johnson. Yeah, we're guaranteeing to have uh, the, the servicing parts. The nice thing on these is there's not a whole lot of servicing parts compared to others. A lot of these parts for bulk units are interchangeable where some of our other products that we go against, you have a different part number for every single part that's in there. Yeah. This, um, on the outdoor LED, you remember I told you you can get any, all the information that you get on the app, you can actually get on the outdoor LED. So, you know, if the unit is in standby mode, the LED is going to show a zero. If it's running in cool mode, it's going to show a number two. If it's in heat mode, it's going to show a number three. If it's in uh, oil return mode, it's going to show a number four. So it's going to give an indication of where you are. Actually, when you commission these units sometimes, looking at the, the LED is kind of a good indication when you're actually setting up the unit and, excuse me, and testing it. Like, you have your thermostat set up. We get a lot of calls when guys first commission the unit because of the T-stat wiring. Right? They, 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 don't, they didn't wire the, the thermostat correctly, or they wired it correctly, but they didn't go in the electronic menu and set the thermostat for a heat pump, especially in markets where guys are just used to straight cooling on a unit. Right? They don't go in and, and, and set that electronic menu um, for a heat pump, or does it reversing va valve energizing cooling or heating, they don't set that up correctly. So they'll, um, they'll commission the unit, and they'll walk away. But then they didn't stop to really make sure that it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. Um, if you have the cover off and you're looking at an outdoor unit, LED, you set the unit to heating, you can actually run outside or have you know, someone outside tell you if this number changed to a three. <coughs> so you know that it's actually in heating, right? Or you can have, it could be on zero, and then you, you, you call for heating or cooling, you want somebody to tell you, hey, the LED changed to, to a one. 
meaning that, hey, it received the signal from the TSTAT, and now it's just waiting to do its thing, all right? So you want to, it, it, it's good to be looking at this LED or have someone looking at that while you're in, while you're commissioning the product. Again, this is just uh, another representation of this slide over here. This BS, th these three buttons up top allows you to scroll through the different menus and set these functions, right? These are the functions, most of you guys, because your unit comes with an IoT gateway, you'll never touch these buttons. You'll never do this out here because it's so much easier to just pull out the app, choose how you want the unit to run, and be done. Um, but this information is in the manual, how to actually navigate through the menu to choose and set up the, the different customizable features on the unit. Uh, Wes mentioned night mode earlier. Night mode is brilliant because you can actually tell the unit to run in silent mode and what level of silent mode you want the unit to run in. And you can choose what time you want that unit to run in silent mode and what time you want it to exit silent mode. So what silent mode does is, it lowers the compressor speed, it lowers the fan speed, outdoor unit. So the outdoor unit gets a lot quieter than normal. And you can do that at night because at night you're at part load condition, right? Outdoor, outside temperature is no longer 105 or 95. It's now 78 or 72 outside. So your, your load requirement is not as high. So you can use, it's almost like in the daytime you need a 18,000 BTU unit, but at night you, use, you need only 9,000 or 12,000, it's equivalent, because your, 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 your load conditions are not as extreme. So that's what you're doing, you're, you're just slowing down the system and you're still maintaining your, your comfort level on the indoor unit. And you're helping out your neighbor or yourself, depending on where the unit is installed, because it's a much quieter system. Because the ambient noise outside is not as, as high, so it won't mask this as much. Um, same thing, this, and again, this was before we made the changes where you can actually make, look at the system so comprehensively on the, on the app. On the outdoor unit LED, you can actually scroll through and see how the unit was set up. You can tell, you know, you press the, the button one, BS3 once, and it's gonna show zero one. And then you release it, and then it's telling you H3. This means that the unit was commissioned as a heat pump three ton. Had it been commissioned as a heat pump two ton, this would be H2. Right? Um, it's going to tell you, you, pr you push that button twice, it's going to show you 0, 2, and then it's going to show number 10. If the, if, the, if the subcooling were 10 degrees, it would show 0, 2, and then 10, meaning 10 degrees subcooling. Same thing three times, uh, superheat. And all the way through, so if you push it seven times and release, it's going to show you what the high pressure is. So it's actually giving you the actual numbers. You don't have to, you know, calculate anything or figure anything out. It's, it's your actual number. Um, tells you the ambient temperature, the, the compressor suction temperature, compressor discharge temperature. It's all there to see just by using that check button. But again, you guys are not going to do that because you have the app, so you, you're able to actually see it. Exactly. Rick phones don't work. Or, 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 oh yeah, there, there are some, um, some, some dealers, some, some, some guys who, it's their business, but they have a buddy that they work with, a friend, right? They might not be able to go on the job site, but they can send a friend out, and you know, that would be able to, be able to, to navigate through the system. Um, and you, you were asking about the error codes, what if you don't have the IoT gateway and you can't really see, or you don't have um, internet service and you wanna know what error code the unit went out on, you, you actually push the button 23 times and it's gonna give you the current fault. What's the, the you push it 24 times and it's gonna give you the one before the current one. Okay. And then you push it 25 times and it gives you the one before that. So you give you the last three error codes. Okay. It's gonna show you. Uh, Don't forget the phone. <laughs> yeah. So if you accidentally pass that one number, you gotta go through the whole thing again. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's 50 times. <laughs> yeah, that's number 50 if you wanna see the last. Yeah. 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 Lose count. Um, troubleshooting, the unit will th throw error codes as well, right? So um, the, the, the first thing that you know, is going to do, it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you like a, a minor code, right? Hey, the unit cycled off on, on power, right? So it's going to give you a C1. Um, but if it, the same code happens three times within an hour, 
then the unit's going to lock itself out. Right? Because at that point, it's saying, hey, it's not something that I can automatically reset. There's, there's something physical going on with this product that I need someone to come on the job site and look at. So it's going to lock itself out, and it's going to throw that error code that you need to go out on. But each time it throws an error code, there's a date and a timestamp of what that error code is, and there's a, uh, an error code um, designation, right? S1, um, C2, whatever it is. If you have the app, and I'll show you, you can actually click on that error code on the app, and it'll give you a troubleshooting step. So it'll give you a triage tree of exactly what you need to do to resolve it, or what's the most, the most likely reason for the error code, right? Uh, a lot of times, errors can be multifaceted, where you know, you know, it might be showing uh, um, like it's, it's a flooded system, right, for example. But it may not be a real flooded system. It could be, uh, so, so the first triage tree, or the only triage tree that's going to be there, is going to primarily be, hey, check your refrigerant level or your takes the opening to make sure you're not flooding back. But upstream of that, it could be a bad temp sensor that's sensing uh, uh, the temperature, you know, incorrect temperature, and that's giving the impression that your system is flooded. So you need to now omit your temp sensor to see if the temp sensor is good or not. Um, the, the, the triage may not cover the, the full breadth of what the, um, the, 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 the root cause could be, but it's going to give you somewhere to start and something to eliminate um, in your troubleshooting process. Hey, Winston, that, and just to make note, uh, a personal story on that. Um, so I, I put a new system, I, I built a house last year, and I put a system in the house I used, uh, uh, cooling only. Shipped it from Orlando. Mm -hmm. You know, the pallet, and you can figure out what that unit you know, looked like by the time I got the iron. Yeah. So it was damaged up, beat up pretty bad. So I had to call Winston, they sent me out some panels. Right. So I changed out the panels. Um, I haven't touched a wrench in 20 years in this industry. I had the installing contractor get it all set up, put the lines up, and they can, so I'm going to start it up. So I got my app out, started up. The first thing I did is it told me that the uh, ambient temperature sensor was not working properly. So I, well, what the heck? So I looked at it and I, so I used the app to take it to the next level, and it showed me a picture of what I needed to do to fix that. Yeah. It wasn't just, hey, go fix this. It said, here is what it is. And I, I didn't push the moment plug in on it. Yeah. That's all I wanted. But it showed me a picture of what to do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it took away, you know, uh, maybe a technician that isn't really trained all the way yet, he may have spent a half hour with that. Yeah. 30 seconds. Yeah, absolutely. Another caveat to that, you prefer that uh, your professional technicians go out and install these. <laughs> yeah. Here, here's. Uh, we're gonna end pretty soon, but here are a couple of uh, field cases. Um, that would be here. Okay. All right. Yeah. We, yeah. We should be done with this section in five minutes. Then we'll we'll uh, connect Rick's phone um, to the PC, and we'll just show you what the app looks like for, for those of you who, who haven't really seen it live. Um, but this, this is a, a case where a system was installed with a microchannel uh, coil. And they, they were complaining that they're not getting any heat, and the system was going off on a lot of uh, uh, error code cycle. Error code coming up. We pulled up the history of the unit, and we were able to see how the unit, how the unit was cycling, um, what was going on, the pressures. Let me see if this is. Uh, the, the, the pressures um, and the, 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 the co that the compressor was actually limiting itself and without having gone on the job site, you know, being miles away from the product, we were able to tell that there was some kind of restriction um, towards the indoor side of the unit. With some probing question, we asked the contractor to go check the, the, the coil and he came back, hey, yeah, there is a uh, microchannel uh, coil on the indoor unit. We had him, had him replace that, unit started working, no problem. Uh, this is a case of a unit that was um, liquid, liquid slugging, and you could tell by the, the, the subcool and superheat numbers how very low they were. The discharge superheat on the unit was only 3.3 3 .3 degrees Fahrenheit generally. 
The discharge superheat, you want it to be above 25, ideally above 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Had him um, adjust the, the refrigerant charge and the, um, the compressor started running uh, much better. The superheat and subcooling numbers were more ideal and your discharge superheat came in a lot better, right? And this, is, and this was just going back and looking at the history of the product. When you, when you select certain um, parameters to look at, it's going gonna, it's gonna to display that, those parameters as a, uh, a, a graph. And over time, you can actually see how the unit is doing, um, if it's chattering, things like this. Um, so very, 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 very user friendly. Please go back again. What is the compressor or this sluggish? Yes, this, this is the one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so here, here you have the compressor. Um, the RPS looks, it's, it's on the lower end. It's not gonna. It's not gonna go up much higher than this. When the compressor uh, is sluggish, that means it is a liquid. Like it is liquid. Liquid, liquid there. It is liquid how to there. remove it? There. Huh? How to remove that liquid? You're, you're gonna have to, to re um, release refrigerant from the system. You're gonna have to recover refrigerant from the system, right? A, si a unit can can operate with some level of liquid slugging, but not for very long, right? Um, if it's if it's for a long time, then it's gonna destroy the compressor for for a relatively short period of time. It can survive. I'm going, to I'm going to tell you a story. We had a case, um, and this is kind of extreme, but we had a case of a mini split unit a few years ago um, where we sold a mini split unit to a guy uh, in Miami. The unit was installed. Six months later, we got a phone call saying the mini split was dead, right? So we replaced the, the product for the customer. Six months after that, I swear, Almost six months to the day after the second unit was installed, we got another call, the unit's dead. So we said, this doesn't make any sense. Let's go to the job site and see what's going on. So we drove to the job site, and this guy had the mini split installed, and he had a liquid line sight glass on the low pressure line. So you, that, that means, you know, with a mini split, the, the reason I say this, a mini split has the metering device on the outdoor unit, right? So on the, there's no liquid line going to the indoor unit. It's two vapor lines. So he was charging it to clear the, to clear <laughs> the side glass. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, 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 refer, that, that compressor was pumping like a pool pump the whole time. For six months, it ran like a pool pump, right? Because this guy thought, it was, he thought of it as a traditional unit. Um, so that's why I'm saying the, the compressors will last some time. With, with some degree of, of liquid slugging, but it can't last forever. Six months, it ran like a, like a pool. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> but yeah, so yes, yeah, so these are, are, are you know, some cases where we've, we had um, either units overcharged or undercharged. This one, the compressor, it wouldn't go above 16 rotations you know, with a very, very high pressure. The unit goes off on a high pressure limit at four, 545 PSI. So this particular unit was way, um, um, way high on, on high pressure. Uh, this, this stuff here, I, you know, it's gonna take you guys some time to get familiar with looking at this data and analyzing it and understanding how to, to, to use it as a triage tool, but on the tech support side, we can help you with this. You're gonna get more familiar with it. And besides all this, you're gonna get an error code if something is really, has really gone out of whack, right? You're gonna get an error code. And I'm gonna connect Rick's phone to show you what, those, um, what the error codes look like and how we've actually built you know, solutions uh, in it to help you guys navigate.